My name is Paul Mayer. I won't tell you my whole history, but um, I've been an activist for many years. Uh, I come out of the religious community. I have sort of a different background than most because I started out being a refugee from the persecution of the Jews under Hitler. And I, I, I was a monk for 18 years. And uh, I've been an activist. I go right back to the Civil Rights Movement with Dr. King. And uh, I've been, and about six years ago, I, I've been working for peace and social justice. I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, my God, it's global warming. And I was inspired with a number of other good people to form this organization, the Climate Crisis Coalition, which is one of the sponsors of this whole conference. And I hope you'll get to know more about that. So I'm going to say a few words, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. And um, Just starting on a personal note, I've been spending the last two weeks in Virginia and the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. And I'm going back up there for two weeks because I've been blessed with a, a writing award, a fellowship, to spend uh, a month up there to uh, finish my memoirs, the story of my crazy life. But the reason I mention it, um, being up there in that magnificent countryside, and yesterday taking a eight-hour train ride through the south and then the north and what a, what a gorgeous country we have, you know? What a magnificent country. And, uh, and I think what all of us, and I think this is especially Im important for people from the cities, because I live in a city. I live in East Orange, New Jersey, which is an inner city African American community <coughs> right next to Newark. But for all of us to fall in love with the earth again, is so important to doing this kind of work, that this is not some, some kind of abstract theoretical subject, but we are talking about the earth. The Native American people tell us, tell us to call her mother, and that's not just poetry with them. They feel we have this real connection to Mother Earth. And if you pardon me for using some street language for a minute, Reverend Williams, but you know, uh, in my community, you hear the word motherfucker a lot. And you know, it's like the third word that, you know, and I'm not shocked by it because I hear it on the, but you know, this is actually what is going on. If you understand the earth as mother that way. We are really screwing over the earth, our home, our mother, big time. Big time. So. You know, I drove through that countryside in the train with a broken heart. And uh, I knew I was going to be meeting with all of you. And I was thinking about what to say. And uh, <clears throat> I've been very struck recently by a, 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 an environmental writer called Mark Hertzegard. He's the environmental editor for The Nation magazine. And he, he is about to come out with a book but he's had several articles about this, something he calls generation hot. And he's not talking about show business hot. He's talking about literal hot. And um, uh, generation hot that he's talking about is all the people and their young people who have bor been born since June the 23rd, 1988 when our speaker of this morning, Dr. James Hansen, 1988, he testified before the Congress and he said, we have a global warming problem. By the way, Reverend Waskow, one thing I love about him is he refuses to use the word global warming. He talks about global scorching because that's what it's really about. Global warming, you know, being warm is a nice fuzzy feeling. It ain't about being warm. It's about being scorched in a furnace, alive, being burnt alive. That's what's happening. So Dr. Hansen was the first one that told this nation about global warming. We wish he had paid, we had paid more attention to him, 
But Herzog God says that every child that was born since then is part of Generation Hot. I happen to have a grandson who's going to be 23 this week. I have six African American grandchildren and he was the first one. And since there was no father around, I was the first one to hold him when, when uh, he, he came, came into the planet. So I have a special... So he was right there, generation hot. And every child, including my last grandchild, just born in March, is part of generation hot. And that means that the young people who are in this room, and we as elders, who are their fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, mothers, or just relations, or just people we care about, have this relationship to Generation Hot. And this is serious business, because this is a generation from this moment on that global warming was formally announced, even though it probably began with the Industrial Revolution, uh, sort of 200 years ago or so, are part of that reality. And we have, they have a heavy burden to carry, because I want to say some serious things to you this morning. Because, and I am speaking to the communities of faith. I, w I don't think I am necessarily typical of the communities of faith when I say this. But you know, we have to start talking about the truth telling the truth to our people. We have heard this in some way, that the situation is so far advanced that in fact global warming can no longer be fully reversed. There is so much carbon in the atmosphere and the carbon systems move so slowly that at the moment I believe that our task as people of faith, and just as decent people of conscience, is to avert the worst disasters, because, you know, as Dr. Hansen told us this morning, it is still possible for us to avert some of the worst disasters, but the reality is here, and it is moving, and it is moving. And part of our work with people, and in our thinking, and in our prayer and in our meditation is how to survive this. How to survive this. I want to add immediately, I was going to say this at the end, but I'll say it now, that um, as people of faith, we always believe in, high, in a higher influence in the cosmos. Uh, we believe in miracles. And even in our social movements, we have, and I've been part of most of them. I'm going to be 80 next year, so I've been part of the civil rights, labor, women, peace, you name it. <laughs> I wish I had more to show for it. <laughs> but anyway, um, there, have, there is always the element of the unexpected. And those of us who move in the world of the divine, there is the place for wonders. And who knows, we may be part of that wonders, I was going to give you this as a final quote, but uh, just so that I won't immediately cause, cast a terrible pall of despair. <laughs> I love the story, I love the story of Rabbi Hillel, when he said, even if I knew I was going to die tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree today. So, I think that needs to be our, our pause. But in the meantime, I don't want to let us get away too easily. And I want to say, that I believe the communities of faith may now, now need to assume a prophetic po posture. We need to become prophets. And I'm talking about those wild-eyed, dark, desert prophets like Muhammad and Jesus and Jeremiah and Gandhi, you know, who were not popular, who were not popular because they were telling the truth to the people. They tried to stone them, they killed most of them, 
And uh, that is the posture we must now assume. And I want to read you a quote this morning from one of my favorite, I seem to be in a rabbinic mode this morning, because this is from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was one of the great Jewish theologians and visionaries. He was one of the first Jewish leaders to march with Dr. King. And uh, this is a book, he wrote a book on the prophets. And this, I think, summarizes the posture we must now assume. And since he wrote 50, 60 years ago, he uses man and male, it, was, it, it applies to women as well, of course. But he says, the prophet is a man who feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul, and he is bowed and stunned at man's fierce greed. Frightful is the agony of man. No human voice can convey its full terror. Prophecy is the voice that God has lent to the silent agony, a voice to the plundered poor, to the profane riches of the earth, of the world, the profane riches of the earth. It is a form of living being a prophet, a form of living, a crossing point of God and man. God is raging in the prophet's words. And I believe the time has come, especially for the community of faith, since it still, rightly or wrongly, enjoys a certain amount of credibility with the public at large. Sometimes when we look at some of our shadow sides, I wonder why, but anyway, and so we have an important role, and I think we have to assume this prophetic role. And the time for making nice has stopped. Now it is, it's good to see churches have solar panels and tell their people to change their electric light bulb. Those things are good, and I'm not disparaging them, but much more is called for. We must summon that prophetic tradition that exists within every one of our traditions, Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. We were founded and led by prophets. And the, in Hebrew, the prophet, Navi means the prophet is God's mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And God is not pleased, if I can presume to speak for God. God is not pleased what we are doing to this beautiful creation. So, that is, we must speak the truth to our people. We must tell them how far advanced it really is. But then, and here is something that we don't have time to talk about in great length. I think the time has also come in our ministry, in our work with our people and with each other. We have to, there has to be a preparation of living with this disastrous situation. And the, I think we have to prepare ourselves for a lot of counseling. Because even though the American public at the moment, who belongs to a, one, what Mencken, I, Mencken the great social critic called booberdom, you know, the level of political intelligence in this country is pathetic. And I'm not talking about people didn't get into school, I'm talking about the people that went to school and still think the earth is flat. So, um, so uh, there is so, but there will be a moment of awakening. I went to this one lecture in the Museum of Natural History, and there was a famous physicist, and he was asked, Professor So, he he had been, I think, under Secretary of Energy under Clinton or something, you know, and a famous physicist. And they said, Professor, what do you, what is your prognosis about all this? And he paused for a moment, and he said, You know what? Most people don't change their lives until after the first heart attack. And I have been thinking of that ever since. Because the heart attack is coming. Of course, it already has come in other parts of the world. You know, in 2003 in Europe when thousands of people died of the heat, 25% of the wheat harvest in Russia was just destroyed this summer. They have serious food problems. A lot of dead and sick people. You don't have to convince the people in Pakistan where 30% of the country is underwater. You know, 
the heart attack has come. But we managed to ignore what happened in the Gulf. And of course, in Katrina, all we did was mistreat poor people and black people. Um, but I fear, and actually on my better days, I, think, I hope it comes sooner rather than later, because if the heart attack comes in 15 years, it may really be too late to do anything about it, as Dr. Hansen told us this morning. So having said all that, I go back to that we have to be a people who live, as, as we tell the truth to our people to eat and, and each other, we continue to live in hope, we continue to live in faith, and mind you, the counseling that I talk about, I say this to our elders in particular, a lot of it will have to be done with our young people because they are so much more honest than, when, than we are, than the elders are. And they will realize, as they did during the height of the nuclear weapons crisis, when there was a, an epidemic of depressions and even suicide among young people, and that's when the mothers, by the way, really got involved. Women strike for peace and think uh, an opposing nuclear weapons. But we have to start, and I'm, there's a wonderful project, and I'm going to end with this, it, not because you have to follow that project, but just the idea. I was somewhat involved in starting it, but it's gone off on its own, and it's called Earth Circles. But the idea is that people gather in living rooms, and in churches, synagogues, mosques, schools, in small circles, and talk about this. And this is not just therapy, that's part of it. First of all, it give, we need to give people space, especially young people, to talk about their feelings. <coughs> and I was involved in a wonderful project called Children of War, where we had teenagers from war zones and that was the secret of this powerful project because the young people gathered and they shared their feelings to each other and they listened to each other. And um, so anyway, we need to have those kinds of gatherings where we talk about all this. I think I've talked long enough. And, uh, <laughs>